That's good. <clears throat> Today I want to do a little something different as we get started. I want you to think about what is your desire before we get into the sermon. And so the best way to illustrate how your desires can get you into trouble is if you're, guys, if your wife is here or your significant other, I want you to look at her right now. Look her in the eyes and say, I love you. Now, I want you to listen to me and be careful. Because I also want you to look into her eyes and say, even though I love you, I'm going to have four or five other women. <laughs> and if anybody tells you that, lady, you black his eye. <laughs> you get that, Gunner? What is your desire when it comes to God? Is God enough? Or do you need other things besides God? Think about that this morning. As we come to this passage of Scripture, what we're looking at is an invitation from Christ. Eight chapters are almost complete in the Gospel of Mark. He's had a public ministry. And he has been teaching people the things of God. He's been showing people the power of God. And now he offers an invitation. We are accustomed to invitations in the modern day church where we play the soft music, which our ladies do a good job. And we present the gospel and we offer things that would make your heart seek after the things of God. But I'm going to be honest. That's not what Christ did. Mark 8, beginning with verse 34, I ask that you stand out of respect if you are able to the reading of God's word. And when he had called the people to him with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words and this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man, also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Heavenly Father, we're thankful today that you loved us so much that you sent your Son from a glorious and beautiful heaven to come here and walk on this earth and to give his life for us that we might have life eternal. Not just in the future, but now, Lord. And so, Father, my prayer is that you bless this word. And, Lord, we see your invitation for what it is to come to your kingdom, not as we choose, but as you demand. And so, Father, I pray that you touch hearts and change lives for all eternity. Lord, give us wisdom to follow you and to understand. We love you. We thank you. 
And it's in your Son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Everyone needs to understand these verses. Understand them as an invitation to come to the kingdom of God. What Jesus is saying throughout his teachings is that this is the only way to life. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. He says, I am the bread of life. This is the only way to come for forgiveness, as the psalmist says, that he will forgive us and cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. This is the only way to, to get to heaven. As John chapter 14 says, he goes to prepare a place. And if he goes to prepare a place, he will come and receive us there. And as John says, our morning shall be turned to joy and our sorrow to peace. It's the only way to have joy and peace in your life. Matthew 16 and Luke 9 are parallel passages of this passage that I read this morning. And so I challenge you through the week to go to those gospel accounts and read the same text. This invitation is consistently how Jesus gives an invitation. And I want to show you that. So you need to mark your place and begin to search the scriptures with me as we go to Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32. And I'm going to move quickly. I have my Bible marked and I'm going to try to move right along. I know they're roasting the ovens and there's restaurants we need to beat the other churches too. So I'm going to try to let you out on time. But notice this in verse 32, chapter 10 of Matthew, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. We just don't hear preachers saying that at the invitation time in the modern day church. Notice Luke's gospel in chapter 9. Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, beginning with verse 57. Now, as it happened as they journeyed on the road, that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You get the implication? There's a guy that wants to walk the aisle, wants to receive Christ, and he says the right things. Lord, I'll follow you wherever you want to go. I'll be with you. I'll walk with you. And he says, listen, you need to count the cost. A fox has a hole in the ground and a bird has a nest. But if you follow me, you may not have nothing. He goes on to say. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, let me first go and bury my father. Let me get the inheritance. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having out his hand to the plow or grabbing hold to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. That doesn't sound like a modern day preacher, does it? These people want it to come with Christ. But he says, you need to count the cost. It's not an easy journey. We strive, the Bible tells us, to enter into the kingdom of God. It is a war to get into the kingdom of God. Satan is attacking the soul, and so we fight and we hold the line so that we might enter into the kingdom of God because of the truth of the gospel. Go with me to Luke chapter 13, verses 23 through 24. In Luke's gospel, these things kind of run parallel. So Luke says in verse 23, chapter 13, Then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter. Through the narrow gate, 
For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Do you hear that from preachers today? Then once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us, and he will answer and say to you, I do not know who you are or where you are from. Then you'll begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets, but he will say, I tell you, I do not know you. Where are you from? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. These are people that actually were in the church house, if you will. They ate with Jesus, and they drank with Jesus. They fellowshiped with the church. And he came time to enter to heaven, and they knocked on the door, but he said, I don't know you. You don't hear that from preachers today. You just don't hear it. Then in Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 26 and 27, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, whoa, do you hear that from preachers today? And wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That's pretty rough. But that's from God, the creator of the universe and the giver of life. He says, you need to count the cost and determine if picking up the cross is worth it to you. Is that your desire? What is your life worth? What is it worth? John's Gospel, in chapter 12. In verse 25, Jesus speaks and he says, He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Are you willing to give your life totally and completely to Christ? Not many preachers preach that. Not many invitations sound like that. And if you're wondering, those passages of scriptures that I read were invitations of Christ to come to his kingdom. We don't hear that. So here's the statement you need to understand. Count the cost and decide. Is Christ worth it? Count the cost. You know, I have three points this morning. They're very brief. So if you will, go with me to the text, and let's begin in verse 34. And I want to show you the standard. In verse 34, Jesus said, He called the people to Him. Not just His disciples, but the people. This is an invitation. And when he had called the people to him with his disciples also, he said to them, here's the standard, and the first part of the standard is this, self-denial. Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Stop right there. That is self-denial. You don't get to do what you want to do because it seems good to you. You don't get to, to live like everybody else in the world because they're having fun is not what God requires or demands. He is Lord of the universe. He is King of kings. And he has made a statement and he said, you need to give up your personal desires. You need to deny yourself for the things that you think are fun. Look at the scriptures and determine if you want to serve Christ. We don't do that. And from the pulpits across this land, I'm going to say very few pastors are going to say something to that nature. They will say this. If you'll come to Christ, you're going to have a good journey. And He's going to bless you with blessings untold. 
Now those are half-truths. The journey to heaven is always a good journey. But it's filled with problems. He never says that you're going to have an easy life. He never says you will not have trials or tribulations, but a lot of pastors will tell you that. He says, I will help you through the troubles of life. You will make the journey if you commit to him, and you will get to the other side, but never, never think it's an easy trip. Deny yourself. Is Christ worth denying yourself? What are your desires? Do you want what God wants for your life? What are your desires? Let me show you a couple of passages of scriptures. Look with me in Galatians chapter 2. And I want you to see these, and so they're on the screen, so that you can look them up ahead of time. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. This is what Paul decided. Did he deny himself? You be the judge. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. You think he denied himself? Read about Paul. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He had to come from a rich family. He had a place of authority and power. He was going into the different uh, towns and dragging Christians out. He had that kind of authority. Did he deny himself? Certainly. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He counted the cost. He realized that he was going to die. But it was worth it to him because he was willing to give up life in this land, in this world, for the next. Are we willing to do that? In Philippians chapter 3, and I'm going to read part of this beginning with verse 5. Here's who Paul is. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law. Blameless, he said. He had it all in this world. But then he met Christ. And he began to understand that this world is not important. I used to know the average uh, length that people would live. I think it's up now, right? About 77 years for a female. About 75 for a male. Isn't that the average? It's close. I, I want you young people to realize that's an average, right? You know how you get an average? You take a young person when they die and an old person when they die and you get that average. They average them together. So you look around and everybody that's over 75 or 77 is using up somebody's time. Could be yours. You got to decide. The second point, he says, take up your cross. We don't understand what it means when Jesus said, take up your cross. Oh, I carry my cross, I go to work, and I have a Bible, and people persecute that. And they don't like me reading the Bible around them. That's not what he's talking about. In the lifespan of Jesus, 33 years, in Palestine, in the area that he's in, 30,000 people were crucified. About a 1,000 a year. And they would crucify them next to the roads or in places like on tall hills where they could see it. So the populace would know that if you got outside of Rome's will, that you would be persecuted with a cross. It was a symbol of death. He says, deny yourself, and you must be willing to die for Christ. They understood when he said, 
Take up your cross. Give up your life. Are you willing to die? Would you stand for Christ in persecution? Would you let them cut your head off for Christ? That's the question. That's an invitation from Christ. Are you willing to do that? The third point is this. He says, follow me. Now that sounds pretty good, right? But you remember I read that little part, those verses before, where the guy came and said, Jesus, I'll follow you. Wherever you want to go, I'll follow you. And he said, you know, the old fox has a hole. And the bird has a nest, but if you follow me, you're going to have nothing. Are you willing to give up everything for Christ? You may not even have a place to lay your head except the ground that he created. Are you willing to give up your house, your bank account, your cars, and even your family for Christ? Well, that's tough. But that's Jesus. That's not some preacher on the television. That's not some evangelist in a tent somewhere. That is the Word of God. Look with me in 1 John. He says, are you willing to follow? 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. He who says... He abides in Him. In other words, you say, I'm a Christian. You go by the name Christian. You say, I've been saved. John writes and he says, He who says that ought himself to also walk as Christ walked. How do I know it's Christ? The His is capitalized, right? It's a proper noun for Christ. You ought to walk as Christ walked. People ought to know who you are. And that's his invitation. He says, listen, you need to deny yourself, you need to be willing to die, and you need to be an example that people know that you are my child, and if you're not, then you're not. Well, that's tough. But then there's another point, and I call it the situation. If you look at verse 35 back in the text... Notice what he says in verse 35. Here's the situation. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. That's a tough situation. We all want to live, right? I go to the hospital, and I've been with a lot of people over my ministry, and I've held hands with people that have died while I was holding their hands. I've had one family that uh, they were going to unplug the machines, they call it, and you punch these buttons. And they didn't want the doctors and nurses to do it. They wanted the preacher to do it. So I went into the hospital over at Baptist and Jackson, and the nurse, the doctor showed me what buttons to push when they were ready. And I cut the machines off. But they kept living. There's something in us that makes us want to hold on to this world even though we know there's something better. I went in one night and the doctor said, Brother Andy, as in Yezus sitting at the hospital, a lady named Miss White from Holly Bluff, Marsha, she's from Holly Bluff. And they said she's going to be dead by morning. So I went and prayed with the family. And by all rights, she should have died that night at 2 o'clock in the morning. She sat up and wanted to die at home. We hold on to life. Are you willing to give up your life in this world for the next world? We want to hold on to life as we know it. When something better, and that's why we're studying Revelations on Sunday night, and we're looking at what's better. Heaven is a better place, but you have to give up this world to get to heaven. Are you willing to give up this world for heaven? So what's at stake? Your soul. Your soul is at stake. And there's a key question. 
He says, what good is it? If you gain this whole world and you lose your soul, what good is it? To have everything and then die. There was a guy that, oh, he's a great farmer, and he began to build barns. It's in the Scriptures. And he built more barns because his crop was growing. It was going to be a bumper crop. He got all the barns built, and he filled it up with grain, and he was going to relax. And God said, you fool, tonight your life will be required. Life is short. And Jesus said, deny yourself. Take up the cross and follow me. What do you think? What do you think? For what will the profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his life? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What is your soul worth? Do you really want to live forever? I do. But not here. I'm going to live forever. Christians live forever. I'm so excited. I count at the cost. Now, I'm not a perfect person, and I don't deny myself like Christ would, but I'm going to tell you something. He's worth it. Christ is worth it. And one day, I'm going to close my eyes in death. And I'm kind of selfish. I don't want to suffer. Heart attack would be pretty good, wouldn't it? Fall over, close your eyes, and open your eyes and see Jesus. What's it worth? What is your soul worth? There's a settling point three, and I'm going to close. He said, For whoever's ashamed of me, are you ashamed of Christ? Are you ashamed of Christ? How much do you read this? How much do you study about Christ? Are you ashamed of Him? So much ashamed you won't pick up the word that tells you about Him and you won't read and study? And He says if you read it, if you are ashamed of Him, He will be. Ashamed of you. Now that's a real invitation. That's a real invitation. He says, count the cost. He said, count the cost. What's your soul worth? I want you to count the cost right now. What is your soul worth? $1,000? A house, a car. What would separate you from the love of God? Whatever it is, that's your soul's worth. Let me tell you what your soul was worth to God. Here we are at Christmas time. We're in the middle of the season where we remember that God looked down on the world and He knew that we needed help and he sent his only begotten son who came and was born in a little manger and he walked on this earth for 33 years and he gave his life. He drained out his blood to cover our sins. That's what God thinks your soul is worth. I read the scriptures. and I read, I read about Christ and how he, he suffered for us and I thank God he did it for me. He did it for me. And he said, Andy, listen, all you have to do is deny yourself. Be willing to die for me and walk where I walk and do what I command you to do and you can have life eternal. Do you trust me? And I trust him. I have nowhere else to turn. There's nowhere else to turn. Either you turn to Christ or you go to hell. It's your choice. 
Here we are in the modern church. We're playing the soft music. We're going to sing softly and tenderly. Jesus is coming. But as we sing that, you remember that Christ and the wording in the Greek was he was upset. Halfway through the Gospel of Mark, the storms had been calmed, the thousands fed, and the sick and lame healed, and they won't come to Christ. Don't you be one of those. You come to Christ. Father God, we thank you for this day and for all the blessings that you show us. And Lord, we hear you calling. And Father, I pray that you give people strength today to answer that call. And Lord, there's one lost here today. You draw them into your kingdom in a mighty way. That you allow them to feel your presence and to feel the pressure of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, you give them the strength and courage to come and confess you as Savior and Lord. Oh, Father, be good to us today. Thank you for grace and mercy. And it's in your Son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Let's stand.